Farm Excellence Programme at HDB really is a project set up to demonstrate the value of implementing best practice on farms. We have uh, nine strategic and monitor farms located across England. It's a four-year programme where farmers will be able to learn from industry experts, learn about the challenges and opportunities on those host farms and hopefully go away with a lot of knowledge that they can implement on their own farms. Hi there, we're at um, Scadge Hill Farm just outside viewed in Cornwall today uh, for our Monitor Farm launch. We decided to apply so I really felt that we um, would hopefully be able to add something and be able to encourage other people to, to become engaged with AHDB. On-farm events are so important because they provide the opportunity to come and see, to feel and sometimes even taste um, the information that we're talking about. We hear from lots of different industry experts, um, farmers, consultants and the farmers get the opportunity to talk about what they've learnt over a cup of coffee or often a bacon sandwich. For us, certainly, I think they're really important. You get to, to go and visit other people's farms, see what they're trying, see how they're able to implement changes. Always keen to, to learn something. It's just getting information from people, really, what everybody else is doing going forward. I hope that people will come and view the farm with us, take some ideas that um, some of the things that, that we've already started to implement, um, but also perhaps be able to feel confident to come back and ask us a question. And it's also a great opportunity to feed into the topics that will be discussed at further meetings and also sign up to the discussion group as well in the local area. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to this AHDB webinar. My name is Sarah Penrose and I work in the Beef and Lamb Knowledge Exchange team. So tonight's webinar is the last in the series of three web webinars that we've run over the last couple of weeks. And they've been run collaboratively with AHDB, with Chagas and BSAS all discussing how we can practically um, reduce carbon emissions from livestock production. So tonight's webinar is focusing on how we can better use genetics and breeding to reduce carbon emissions. The recordings from the previous two webinars are available on our Beef and Lamb YouTube channel. So if you did miss those, you can go and uh, watch them again over on, on the YouTube channel. So tonight we'll have regular breaks, uh, question breaks throughout. So whilst our speakers are presenting, please make sure you do send in your questions. And then it's my job to ensure that they're, they're read out and you get the answers from our speakers this evening. So just a reminder of how to ask a question. And um, if you go to your toolbar on the right hand side of your screen, you will see there is um, a question header. If you click on that, it will expand uh, the question box. So just type your question in there and just remember to press send. As I say, I will then read it out in one of our many uh, question break slots. Um, and please remember, there are no silly questions. We are here to learn. So without further ado, we'll introduce our speakers for this evening. So Kim, I will come to you first. Do you just want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Kim Matthews. Um, I'm Head of Animal Breeding and Product Quality at AHDB. So I'm gonna be talking to you in a bit about, about breeding for uh, reduced feed intake, uh, but I'm also the current president of the British Society of Animal Science. So it was great to bring the two organizations that I, uh, that I represent together in this series of webinars to bring the science and the farming together and hopefully uh, we can learn from each other and and get get something that's useful on farm from the science that uh, that the members of BSAS are all all engaged with. Brilliant, thank you. And seeing as it's Pancake Day, what's your favourite topping? Oh well, you see, I quite I quite like to have a several pancakes with different toppings, but you oh. have to finish with the, sh the the lemon and sugar option because that's tradition. Brilliant, brilliant. And our second speaker for this evening will be Noreen McHugh. Um, Noreen, do you just want to introduce yourself? 
Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Noreen McHugh. I'm a research officer uh, with Chagask uh, in Ireland. So my work mainly focuses around breeding um, and animal genetics for sheep, beef and dairy and trying to improve uh, the genetic makeup of the national herds uh, and flock. So today I'm going to be talking about what we're doing in breeding to try and reduce methane emissions from an Irish perspective. And hopefully there will be some take home messages that will be uh, relevant to, to all stakeholders. Brilliant, thank you. And of course, what's your favourite topic? I'm a bit of a traditionalist as well, so I'm the same as uh, Kim. I like my uh, sugar and the lemon and the pancakes. Yeah, me too, me too. <laughs> yeah. What do they say? If it isn't broken, don't try and fix it. Um, okay, so we will um, hear from Kim first. So Kim is going to present on the Beef Feed Efficiency Project. Over to you, Kim. Just uh, just get my slides up there. There we are. Hopefully you can see those now. Yeah. So uh, yes. So um, so I'm going to yeah talk about breeding for reduced feed intake. But I'm also before I do that, I'm going to give a bit of context and background to to the topic. So so why are we particularly interested in breeding? Uh, as opposed to other other ways in which we might tackle greenhouse gas emissions or any other aspect of animal production, really. So with breeding, the, the benefits or improvements are permanent and cumulative, by which we mean each generation, the starting point was the end of the previous generation. So uh, we can keep building generation on generation and, and get those improvements uh, throughout. Um, Breeding can also contribute to reduced environmental impact uh, and does that by in, uh, ensuring that each generation is superior to its parents. Um, also, uh, not everybody is necessarily directly involved in, in the improved animal breeding, but that benefit does percolate through the industry. If those sort of represented by the yellow triangle there at the top of that, that pyramid, uh, those at the top improve, then those breeding stock disseminate throughout the industry and, and bring improvements to others as well. And breeding can impact also all aspects of, of livestock production. So um, we can have improved reproductive performance as well as the feed efficiency that we're going to talk about in a minute. And, <clears throat> and also uh, improved animal health can also contribute. So ultimately uh, benefiting financial performance as well as uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, the UK beef genetics landscape is a is a bit complicated. So just to sort of give you an, an overview of that, really, and, and I hope I'm not just uh, telling you stuff you all already know, which which perhaps I am, but it gives us a bit of context. So so we have the breed societies. They coordinate the pedigree recording and the, the pedigree breed improvement. Um, and they're using a, a variety of different service providers to do their genetic evaluations. Uh, the breeding companies uh, will use some of that information from the breed societies and also their own um, their own information from from data that they collect themselves. So, what is AHDB's role? So, we are able to access, working in partnership with SIUC, uh, a number of data sets which wouldn't be available to those individual breed societies. So, national data sets like the BCMS data, uh, and also data that's provided by other other parties uh, that that may not wish to work with an individual breed society. So, the abattoirs, for example. And we'll come on to some of the data that, that we get from those. So we produce from that what we call the national beef evaluations. And if you want to access those, the, the web link is there at the bottom of the page here. Um, so in the blue, the top left box, these are the, the carcass traits which we started with when we established the national beef evaluation. So we have days to slaughter, uh, which is uh, also very useful, not just from a financial perspective, but the animals that reach slaughter quicker are obviously producing methane for a shorter period of their life. And therefore, um, it's, it results in reduced methane emissions uh, from that animal. 
Um, also then obviously the carcass attributes that we measure at slaughter, carcass weight, confirmation, carcass fatness, and also average daily gain, obviously bringing that, that days to slaughter and carcass weight together. Um, more recently, we've launched the maternal traits, so age at first calving, productive lifespan for the cow and calf survival. And then on the right hand side, we have some things that are either on the way or we would like to investigate bringing in the future. So on the way, we will hope to be launching host resistance to TB, which is already out there for the dairy breeds and feed efficiency, not yet uh, available, but uh, on very much on the way. And then there's a range of other things that we might be interested in looking at uh, from the kind of data that we might be able to access. So how can we use these national beef evaluations? So uh, for individual farmers that can help make breeding decisions within the herd. Uh, the, they can inform the breeding companies about the, the decisions that they're making in terms of uh, the bull marketing that they do and the trials that they run in, in house. And it can refine the selection of sires for premium schemes. So. Um, retailers or processors running particular premium schemes can use this to uh, to sort of hone down on which sires they wish to um, wish to include in those schemes. Um, so one of the aspects of this of course is one of the biggest influences is going to be the selection of appropriate bulls to use in the dairy herd especially when we think about uh, AI companies. So why are we particularly interested in, in beef coming out of the dairy herd? So there are a couple of trends that have been taking place which make this uh, increasingly important. So uh, for one, there's a, a rapidly growing use of sexed semen in the dairy herd so that the dairy female replacements are being um, <clears throat> actively selected using uh, female sexed semen so that there's then uh, fewer inseminations with uh, the dairy breeds needed to produce those replacements and then linked with that uh, that obviously leaves then more cows in the dairy herd for which you can use beef semen and you can see here in the gray bars at the top as the um, dairy semen use drops uh, so the beef semen use increases. So there's more and more beef coming out of the dairy herd that is sired by one of those beef breeds. Um, there's a there's a knock-on benefit uh, of the beef from the dairy herd. Uh, one uh, number of benefits, but one of which I want to highlight is the Enviro Cow Index. Um, so this is an index that looks at how the dairy cow can be selected to be more uh, environmentally um, environmentally or have a reduced environmental impact, let's say. Um, and you can see in the green line there on the graph, uh, that has increased even before the uh, Enviro Cow Index was launched, which just is a good illustration that when we select for improved productivity, we are often selecting for improved environmental performance by default. Uh, so that that's a, a positive. And then you can see that that curve has kinked up at the end as that Enviro Cow Index uh, comes in as well and people are starting to use that. And in the dairy herd, um, it's estimated that genetics will contribute to a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2040. So significant um, contribution from breeding. And of course, that will have a knock-on benefit onto the beef uh, that com is coming out of the dairy herd. So then to turn to the main topic, uh, which is uh, breeding for feed efficiency and the beef feed efficiency program, which is uh, largely funded by DEFRA and AHDB. And before I go into the detail of that, uh, I think we need to just establish what we mean by feed efficiency. So taking a step back for a minute, let's, let's think about cars. And, and I have to thank my, my colleague, Mary Vickers, for this illustration, because um, she, she pulled this together. Um, we think about uh, cars and, and fuel efficiency rather than feed efficiency, getting the more miles that you can from the fuel that, that, that's in the car. There are a number of things that contribute to that. So there's the maintenance of the car, the aerodynamics of the car, the gearing of the car, um, and the route. So you could you could kind of think of those things as being inherent. Those are things that, that you don't change uh, on a journey by journey basis. So that's 
what you might call the management and the environment. Um, and then, sorry, that yes, the management and the environment are those things that you do change, I beg your pardon. So that's the route that you choose, the weather, the driver, and maintaining the car. Those fundamentals about the car, the aerodynamics and the gearing, are things which are fixed when, when you buy the car. You can't change those, generally speaking, uh, when, once you bought it. And that's similar to the genetics, the inherent properties of the animal. And roughly a third of that uh, feed efficiency is down to the genetics. So environment and management really important, but of course those benefits we make through genetics are locked in for future generations. So that's, we know that genetics is valuable, but why focus on feed efficiency particularly? And it, and it has been shown that a 1% improvement in feed efficiency has the same economic impact as a 3% improvement in the rate of growth. And you can select for feed efficiency independently of growth and mature weight. So uh, you can maintain the same growth rate, maintain the same mature size without increasing it, uh, and at the same time reduce the feed intake to achieve that. So um, some historic data has shown that uh, through breeding we can increase the feed conversion ratio by 9 to 15 percent through selection for feed efficiency, improve the calf weight per cow feed intake so that the cow eats less to produce the same amount of calf, um, whilst maintaining the same level of daily gain and mature size and reducing the maintenance of the cow herd. So we're focused on the finishing animal, um, and that, but there are some links back to the cow herd. How do we measure it? Uh, so we have individual feed bins, each of which uh, can detect which animal is feeding at a particular time and, and measure the amount of feed that is consumed. Uh, we happen to be using grow safe equipment. There are, are, are other types of equipment available. We obviously need to know the genetics of the animal, so know its sire and its dam. We put animals in at seven to 12 months and measure them for 63 days um, and try and minimize the variation within a batch. So we're only using steers and within a, within a weight range. So what kind of results can we get? So here you can see um, the kind of results from one, one batch of animals. So you've got each of those blue dots represents eight to 12 progeny of an individual sire. So they're sire average uh, values. And you can see along the bottom the dry matter intake and up the side the daily life weight gain. So just by way of illustration, those two dots circled in red, these are two sires or the groups of progeny of those two sires with a daily live weight gain of around 1.7 kilograms a day, uh, but dry matter intake varying from eight and a half for one of those sires to 11 uh, kilograms a day to the other. So huge differences potential in the amount of feed to, to produce the same uh, amount of growth. Uh, so um, geneticists love these these charts, so I thought I'd better put one in. Um, so this just shows the heritability and genetic correlations. I'll just explain a bit what those are. So in the dark blue boxes with the white text on the diagonal line, those are the heritabilities. So that's a measure of how much of that uh, how much of that factor is contributed by the genetics of the animal as opposed to the environmental effects. So for residual feed intake, it's about 24%, for example, average daily gain about a third and dry matter intake, almost a half of the variation is genetics. All of those are really useful numbers and things we can work with. Some of the uh, fertility traits, for example, would be perhaps a, a fraction of that, a fifth of those kind of values, and, and we can make progress in that. So there's really good heritabilities we can make progress with. And then the, the lighter cells below that are the correlations. Um, so if you have a correlation of one, that would mean those two things are perfectly related and, the, and you, you change one, the other will change exactly in proportion. Um, but these are all less than one. Dry, dry matter intake and average daily gain is getting close to one, so you select for reduced dry matter intake, you will reduce uh, daily gain. Uh, 
Uh, so you need to be careful that you factor both of those in. And one way of doing that is to, to use residual feed intake, which is the amount of food the animal eats over and above an average requirement. So it gives you a good indicator of whether it's a, an efficient animal for feed or not efficient, but it's already taken account of growth rate. So um, you can select for that and not affect growth rate. So what, what's the kind of benefits we can have? So um, it's been shown in phase one of this, this project, this program, that if we select for feed efficiency this in the selection index, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, by 27% or increase the reduction by 27%. So we're already reducing greenhouse gas emissions just by selecting for performance, um, but we can increase that by 27% by directly including feed efficiency in the, in the index. So just to um, let you know what's happening next in the programme, we're in phase two of this programme of intake feed intake recording. That's almost finished. That will finish this spring. Um, we're, we're then going to follow those animals, all those animals through to slaughter and make meat quality assessments just to check that meat quality isn't affected um, negatively by selecting for um, feed, in, feed efficiency. And we will be releasing uh, breeding values um, for in the first instance in the limousin because that's where we have the most data and and we will be we are working with SIUC and the limousin cattle society re to release those breeding values um, again in the early half of the in the first half of this year and then just to conclude to, to, to bring you back to um, British Society of Animal Science if if you enjoy hearing about the science uh, of animal production and you want to hear more about uh, some of that science then do join us at our conference in March uh, the early bird ticket offer closes just towards the end of this month so you have about five days left actually to, to get that early bird price if you're interested in coming along to Birmingham and joining us and we'd love to see you there so thanks, uh, Sarah, oh, back, back to you. Thanks very much, Kim. That was really, really interesting. Um, so the RFI then, will that be shown as, a, as an EBV? And will that be, where will people be able to find that? Yeah, so that's, that's the plan. Um, we're, we're working with the Limousin Society to establish whether it's best rooted through their publication of breeding values or whether we um, bolt it into the national beef evaluations obviously once we've concluded what what the best route is then we will we will put some good comms out around that um, it's 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 obviously there, there's pros and cons to both because we are using crossbred animals so it kind of sits quite nicely with the national beef evaluations which is crossbred in that sense um, but obviously the limousines are very keen that uh, that, that, that they are able to, to identify the, the bulls that are, are best for feed efficiency as well. No, that's it, that's it. Now, and one question that's come in, um, so obviously a lot of the rations that you're using are, are TMR based. Does yeah. that correlate well with a, a grazing animal? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. It is one we're, we're asked quite uh, often. Um, we, one of the criteria we have around the feed is it must be 50% forage minimum. And generally, it's, it's more than that. Um, so, so it does represent a forage diet in that sense. Of course, okay. there will be other factors, animals at grass, there's grazing behaviour and, and such, which we're not going to be able to account for in this. So again, it, it's one of those things that's correlated. So we improve it and we will get a benefit. It won't be perfect, but it'll be heading in the right direction. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And um, does the RFI in, in these young cattle, does that correlate with, with the, the suckler cow? Or is there, is yeah, there again, again, it's a similar answer, really. It, there is a link. So some of the underlying, you know, some of the underlying physiology about how an animal digests feed and so on will be, if that's genetic, then it will influence the cow and, and the growing animal. Some of the aspects to do with partitioning to milk, for example, are obviously not going to affect a steer. So it, again, they're linked. You improve one, you will improve the other, but it's not perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. So we'll now move on to our um, second speaker. Um, 
So Noreen is going to talk about what's happening at uh, Chagas, where they're developing um, a carbon sub index. So over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah. So hopefully you can see my slides now. So yeah, I'm just perfect. So I'm just going to give you a whistle stop tour of what we're doing in Ireland um, across sheep, beef and dairy um, in terms of breeding to re reduce methane emissions. So just to start off with, um, this is what we call the marginal abatement cost curve or the max curve that has been produced for Ireland. And basically it's a blueprint for where can we make the most uh, value in terms of cost um, of implementing a, a strategy that will reduce methane or nitrogen um, and what will the extent be in terms of reducing our overall greenhouse gases. So if you look at this curve here, on the on the x-axis is the cost or benefit of them so for example if we look here low emissions uh, spreading which is on the far right hand side that's going to cost money obviously for farmers to implement but it does obviously have a an impact then in reducing methane um, or nitrous oxide in this in this case the bars then on our y-axis, that's the abatement potential. So the bigger the bar is, the more abatement or the redu reduction in methane or nitrous oxide that we will get from them. And what I want to highlight here is if you look on the right-hand side of this graph, you can see that there's three things listed here. First of all, it's the dairy EBI. So that's the dairy breeding index in Ireland. Then there's the beef uh, live weight gain. So it's, as Kim mentioned, if we can get our animals to slaughter at an earlier age, obviously they're going to produce less methane. And then we have the beef index or the beef MRI included in there. So what you can see here is that obviously genetics has a huge role to play in trying to um, reach our targets to reduce uh, methane, especially uh, from the national herd. So it has a large abatement potential, all these tree strategies, because you can see they're wide bars. They're obviously favorable for a cost benefit point of view. Everyone has to go out and select a, a bull or a ram to breed their yos or their cows to. So in other words, it's something that you have to do. And it's permanent and cumulative, as Kim mentioned as well. So any gains that we make here, they're there and they're there to be built on from years to come. So in Ireland, we've taken a two-pronged approach when it comes to reducing methane emissions from our sheep, uh, beef and dairy population. We've taken an in indirect approach and really that's what we call low hanging fruit. That's using data that's, that's already available to us to try and help improve um, our methane profile from the national herd and the national flock. And there's, the, there's also a direct approach we're taking, which I'll talk about at the end of the presentation. That's probably further up the tree. It um, requires a bit more work, but we're using a combination of both to try and um, Get, reach our targets that have been set out to us uh, by our government to reduce methane emissions. So just to talk about the low hanging fruit for a minute. So this is what, what we'll call our status quo or our actual genetic indexes that we have in place in Ireland at the minute. So you can see here we have an index for dairy that's called our EBI or economic breeding index. Then we have a dairy beef index. That's the second index shown here. And that's basically for selecting beef bulls to breed on our dairy herd. We have two beef indexes, a replacement, so for selecting your females, and a terminal index. And similar on the sheep, we have a replacement and a terminal index. And what I've highlighted here is the relative emphasis that we place on a wide range of traits within each of these. So for example, reproduction, you can see is quite important in both our dairy index and our two replacement indexes for beef and sheep. But one thing I want to know, want you to note that from 2000, at uh, the end of 2002, 22 onwards, we've actually implemented a carbon sub-index into our dairy, um, part of our dairy uh, breeding index. So the carbon sub-index, it's very similar to what Kim spoke about in the EnviroCow index. It's basically to try and reward, reward our bulls or our cows that are reducing the carbon profile from the dairy herd. So it's a relatively new, new, new criteria that's been introduced into our dairy index and we're hoping to follow suit and introduce it into our beef and sheep indexes in the coming year. So what's it actually doing? So this is a graph just showing what the dairy index, so that's our EBI, um, which is shown on the bottom axis here, what it is actually doing to our CO2 or our methane emissions per lactation. And you can see I've highlighted the main breeds here, the Frisian, the Holstein, the Jersey, and the Mount Belliard. And what I want to show is that there was a 
general trend that as you selected on animals that had higher genetic merit on our dairy index, we were producing less methane or less carbon emissions over the entire lactation. So that was good news to start with this indirect approach by selecting animals that had higher genetic merit, you know, for fertility um, and lower live weight gain or lower, lower cows with lower weights, we were actually reducing methane emissions. So in the old EBI, we were saying that we were reducing it by approximately 11 kilograms uh, of CO2 equivalents per year. By adding in this new carbon sub-index, we're actually almost doubling that again. So there's a 55% increase um, in reducing our methane emissions down to 19, uh, to reducing it by almost 19 uh, kilos of CO2 equivalents per year. So a good news story by an indirect approach by farmers going out and selecting on the dairy index or the EBI, they're going to be reducing the overall carbon um, emissions for the dairy herd. If we look at it from the beef, uh, beef side then, what are we doing? So this is actual data where we've measured methane output. So each of these dots here represent an individual animal where we've actually measured methane emissions um, on them in um, a test finishing pretty similar to what Kim has spoken about in the feed efficiency trial. And here we have their terminal index. So how do they rank on the terminal traits so the growth and the carcass traits characteristics? And you can see there's a bit of a trend here. It's, it's very early days yet. We're only starting to collect this data. But what this graph is showing us is that for each 10 euro increase in the terminal index of these beef animals, the methane emissions were reducing by the on order of about two grams uh, lower reduced methane per day. So again, a positive trend by selecting your bulls on an improved terminal index, we were reducing the overall methane emissions. And then finally in sheep, what are we doing at the minute? So again, we've done a similar exercise where we looked at with the best that we have in, in, in sheep, that's what we call our five-star animals compared to our one-star animals. And we looked at the whole system. We looked at, you know, what was the production potential out of our five-star um, animals compared to our one-star animals right through to economics. And we followed that right through to the, uh, the hoof print of these animals. And what we're seeing is that if you went out and selected your ram and the five-star, so the highest genetic merit available, for the replacement index in this case, we see that there's a 7% less CO2 equivalent produced uh, per each kilogram of carcass compared to the one star. So again, all this is showing that the indirect approach by farmers going out and selecting on our current indexes, we're making gains in terms of reducing the footprint across sheep, beef and dairy. So that's the indirect approach that I spoke about. And the final approach that I said we were taking is the direct approach. So that's actually going out and measuring methane on the ground. So this graph here, or these pictures here show examples of what we're actually doing. So this picture here on the left hand side, that's showing how we're measuring methane emissions from our dairy herd. So it's at pasture, it's in the field that we're actually measuring the methane emissions. So what it is, it's using a technology called a green feed. So basically what it is, is a dairy cow can come in, she will be enticed in by a small bit um, of um, nuts. She will eat the nuts while she is in, in the while her head is in the apparatus and while she's eating it, there's a sniffer there that will actually sniff her breath and give us a prediction of methane emissions from that cow at that time point. The cow can go in there a number of times per day so then we're starting to build up a profile on our dairy cows over um, over the day and across lactation as well. So that's what we have in dairy. We have the exact same um, apparatus that we're using the green feeds on our beef herd at the minute. Most of it's been recorded through um, Tully, which is our finishing or a test test center similar to what Kim, Kim spoke about in the feed efficiency trial, and we're measuring it there on our finishing animals. And then on sheep, on the left-hand side, we have a different apparatus called PACS. So they're portable accumulation chambers where a sheep goes into basically for all intents and purposes, an aluminium box for about a 50 minute period. And we get a good profile of the methane emitted by that sheep over that 50 minutes. So we're measuring in the sheep, in the sheep we are measuring approximately 12 animals over the hour so we can get big numbers of animals measured. 
The prerequisite for breeding when it comes to measuring new traits, it must be important. Well, obviously, we all know that methane and environment is, is it's in the media the whole time, so it's obviously important. It must show genetic variability. All our results today and internationally has shown that there's lots of variation between individual animals on methane emissions. But the third criteria is data availability. We need to have lots of data available to us to be able to disentangle what is a genetic effect from an environmental effect or a management effect. So that's why we're really building up our databases at the minute uh, across sheep, beef and dairy. It will be slow going, but over the next number of years, hopefully we will have breeding values for individual bulls or individual rams for methane emissions. So that was the end of my slides. Um, and a quick whistle stop tour of what we're doing in, our, in Ireland. So back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Noreen. That is, it's really, really fascinating. Um, so thank you ever so much um, for that. I know in um, one of the beef slides, you mentioned that there was a 1.7 gram reduction using that thermal index. What does that work out at as a, as a percentage? Yeah, it's relatively small. So on average, our beef cows are producing about 230 grams a day. So it's less than a percent. Uh, but look, that's our starting point. We haven't got yeah. the carbon sub index yet for beef. We hopefully will have that breeding value for methane in the future. So we're looking to push that a lot more in the future. But it's a good yeah. starting point. It, it, at least it's showing, you know, selecting on our indexes. It's not it's not disimproving our methane profile anyway for, for beef. That's it. And do you expect to see um, a bigger difference in, in the dairy than the beef? Or um, do you think it'll be similar in that, that think, reduction? Yeah, I think it'll it'll probably be similar. You know, biologically, um, it should be similar enough between both sets of animals. Um, so, um, you know, maybe, you know, if you take into account the finishing period of the, of the beef animal, um, it might push up the total of meat. Me methane emissions profile of those animals but you know from a genetic point of view I would say we should hopefully be seeing as much variation within our dairy population as we will within our beef population. Brilliant thank you. And just out of interest why did you uh, start with the dairy sub-index first? I suppose the, the most pressure was on you know if you think of numbers in Ireland you know we have a lot more dairy cows uh, compared to the beef cows and um, so it was really just a starting point we started with it the beef one we should have by the end of this year and the same with sheep so we're in a pretty similar position with all three of them but I suppose dairy we started because probably we had a more information to start with um, on the dairy scenario. Brilliant thank you and um, this question for, for both of you. So obviously you've talked uh, quite a bit about the impact of breeding and genetics on carbon emissions. Do you think what we're doing is, is enough or do you think we're going to have to rely on new technologies and in innovation to meet the, the quite strict targets we've been set? I don't know who wants to take that. Uh, that well, yeah, well, um, I... Go, go oh, on, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, well, well, just even from looking at what I showed at the start at the MAC Corp, you know, genetics obviously has a massive role to play, but, you know, there's lots of other technologies out there that can be used to help to reduce our emissions, both from a nitrous oxide or a methane point of view. So I don't think it'll be one, one solution that will address the problem, definitely from an Irish point of view, you know, we're going to have to use you know, a lot of those new technologies ac right across the industry to help to meet our targets. Yeah, yeah I, I, no, I would agree. And I, I think um, CL, the Agritech Centre, has produced a, a, an interesting report that kind of talks about all the different things you can do to um, address net zero in livestock. Um, and it is very much about attending to everything. I think the, the, where we have an advantage in genetics is that if you if you structure an index, you can actually make improvements in all the things you want to at the same time. And so you can be reducing your cost of production at the same time as reducing methane emissions. Um, whereas some of the interventions like, for example, feed additives, there will be a cost attached to using those. So um, I'm not saying that 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 doesn't mean they're part of the part of the picture, but um, let's let's do everything we can that's free, or at least uh, giving us a benefit as well at the same time. 
Yeah, that's it. And I know, obviously, I've sat in, sat in on all three webinars, and I think that's really a key take home message is it's all related to what I would call best practice, you know, by trying to make our cattle and our sheep more efficient, that is in turn reducing our carbon emissions, but <clears throat> they're very harsh targets that we've been set. And I think, like you say, we will have to rely on some of those new technologies and, and innovations to help us a bit further. And um, so going back then to, to what was uh, discussed, I just wondered, is there any research looking at the impact of um, RFI on those fertility traits? Because um, that's something I'm particularly interested in. If if an animal is um, more feed efficient, does that have any correlation with age of puberty or anything like that? Yeah, there, there's there's one um, study which we we were talking about before before we did the webinar actually that um, that that suggests that there is very little effect um, relationship between feed intake uh, um, and any fertility traits. So we can we can select for you know the feed feed efficiency traits without doing any damage to fertility. But I mean, I think one of the one of the things we've definitely learned with genetics, if you if you go back over the years, is is if you're interested in it, make sure you measure it, and then you can track any change and you can rectify it sooner rather than later. And the big, you know, obviously the classic example of that is fertility in the dairy herd, selection for productivity in dairy damaged fertility, and that's been reversed, and it's simply by measuring it and including it in the genetic indexes uh, it, it, that. That trend was reversed. So, um, yeah, it's all about. I mean, Noreen said in her presentation, it's all about having enough data. And so, if if we're if we want to improve it, or even just if we want to keep it the same, then then measuring it is important, and we can include it in that index. Definitely, definitely. Um, so, I don't actually have any more questions come in. So, this is probably a good point, Kim. Do you, with this being the last webinar? Do you just want to highlight the work HDB is doing, obviously apart from the beef feed efficiency project in um, on the environment story? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, so I mean, environment is one of our sort of key key areas um, of focus. Um, the, the reputation of the industry is very important to us, and the environment is obviously our impact on the environment is something that that we need to address. So we're very aligned to to supporting that that move towards net zero, um, that the target that NFU set and indeed government um, has also set. Um, so we have been working with others to to pull together the roadmap for um, for the beef sector. Uh, which which brings together people through the whole the whole chain to look at what are the things that we should be doing to uh, reduce those methane emissions along the chain, uh, working together uh, and and map out the steps that we can take. So you know that there's there's definitely work to do, um, but that document will be produced um, in, within the next few months, um, and and all the key organisations will be asked to sign up to it. And that, but but it's a journey, isn't it? So that will be a starting point, and and we'll have to continue building on that. Brilliant. And Noreen, what what's next for for Ireland? What are you working on over there in regards to to carbon emissions and and the environment story? Yeah. So by the end of this year, Sarah, we're hoping that we'll have the carbon sub index available for beef and sheep, uh, so that you know. That that'll be part of our indexes for you know across all our ruminants then, mm. um, and then we're pushing hard on building up big data sets of actual methane profiles on individual animals to try and get an individual breeding value for methane emissions. So sheep were in a good position in that we can measure about a hundred animals a day um, quite easily, so we can build up big numbers in sheep because of the technology that's available to us. Uh, dairy and beef, it's going to take longer, but we're rolling out the technology that I mentioned, the green feeds um, and lots of different research herds now to try and build up numbers as well. So hopefully within the next number of years, we'll have the carbon sub index and then we'll have individual breeding values for methane across sheep, beef and dairy. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so just a question, um, do the the two of you uh, um, and the rest of the industry believe that methane from animals 
um, as a greenhouse gas is a problem. I know there's been a lot of talk about how it's recorded and measured and I know it's a tricky topic, um, but Noreen, I'll just come to you first just to see what the Irish perspective is and then I'll come to you. Yeah, so from an Irish perspective, um, ir irrespective of we think it's, of it's, it's important or not, it's signed legally into law here that, you know, agriculture has to reduce our methane emissions by 25% uh, by 2030. So that's a target we have to set, uh, that has been set and we have to reach. You know, the fear is if we don't come up with the technologies to show that we're reducing it, there could be a reduction in our national herd or our national flock, which is the last thing we want to see. Um, so the other good news when it comes to methane emissions um, is that, you know, anything that we can do to improve efficiency, so that's in, in improving our productivity, um, especially per kilo, if we measure it per kilo of carcass or per kilo of milk, milk yield or the likes, that's going to improve our methane emissions uh, per kilo of the, uh, per animal as well. So, you know, it's a win-win that anything that we can do to improve efficiency will also reduce our methane profile as well. So, you know, we don't think of it as an isolation. We think of it, you know, improving methane, but also improving the efficiency and the sustainability of our, of our systems as well. Yeah, and how, how are farmers feeling about it in Ireland? Are they they're motivated to make the changes or? Yeah, they... I suppose be because we know and agriculture in Ireland is is the biggest emitter um, of uh, methane emissions. So, you know, there has been a lot of bad press um, about it, you know. So what we're trying to do is turn that message around now and show, you know, we have the technologies available to us to make massive reductions uh, within within our industry and improve the efficiency of the, in the in efficiency of our um, industry as well. So I suppose we're trying to turn a negative into a positive um, but look, yeah, obviously there's been kickback yeah. from from farmers, um, understandably, um, yeah. from from it as well. Brilliant, thank you. And Kim, the same question to you. So, you know, he, I know methane. It, it, there are different ways to measure it and calculate it. What What are your thoughts on? So, the I mean, I, I would I would agree with what Noreen said uh, to a large extent. Um, I think I think for coming at it from a number of perspectives, really. One, you know, we we are really keen that the reputation of, uh, well, in our case, um, British beef and lamb, is is high, and, and <clears throat> one of the things that damages that reputation is a perception, right, right or wrong, that methane emissions um, are a big contributor to to greenhouse gases. Now, of course, I think it's overstated often. But uh, it certainly some of the popular press overstates that the, the impact that, that livestock has. Uh, it certainly at a GB level, but nevertheless, um, you know, it is part of that reputation piece. So if we can improve it and we can have we can go out there and, and tell people we have reduced, I think that's really positive for the industry. Um, and methane is a greenhouse gas. I mean, that nobody debates that. The question is, where does it come from? Um, and I, I think, I think as a sector, what we can do is, uh, as Noreen said, turn a negative into a positive. If we can say we're reducing methane, uh, then that becomes a positive. And whichever way you you look at um, look at the calculations, um, the reduction of methane actually is a positive and in fact if you, if you use some of the sort of proposed newer methods like like GWP star actually reducing methane has a more significant cooling effect um, and so it, it's really it's really a positive story if if we can reduce methane emissions then we can say actually we're contributing to to reducing temperature uh, while co2 is probably still going up um, so I, th I think you know there's a real positive there that we we could draw on brilliant thank you and I, I completely agree you know we can like you say we can turn this into a positive and at the end of the day by reducing methane we're also increasing our efficiency which of course is related to profitability and, and whatnot so it is a it is a win-win though sometimes think we we can feel like we're um, the target of a lot of negativity sometimes. It's sometimes quite hard. Yeah, it's hard. Okay, well, there are no 
further um, questions coming in. Um, so I'll just come to both of you and just ask for your key uh, take home message um, from the past hour. Um, so Kim, I'll come to you first, if that's okay. I mean, I think everything we've just been talking about really says it. You know, it, it's it's focus on those things that we can do now uh, that are having a benefit for for productivity at the same time, and you know, look at yeah, look at look out for uh, feed intake EBVs or feed efficiency EBVs when they come, but don't don't wait for those before doing anything. You know, it, it is about all the little things that can improve productivity and and reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same time um there is there is going to be no one silver bullet yeah. so uh yeah let's uh let's do what we can that's it we just need to work together don't we as a as an industry and keep sharing knowledge um norin what's your take-home message yeah, so pretty similar. I think, you know, the buzzword is sustainability at the minute. And I think there's three pillars to sustainability. You know, there's the economic, there's the social and environmental. And, you know, environmental is not going away anytime soon. Um, and hopefully what I've shown you and what Kim's shown you today is that, you know, breeding can play a massive role in um, improving this and helping to address this issue, you know, and again, turning that negative um publicity into a positive for the agricultural industry. Brilliant. And actually just whilst you've you've been talking, we've just had a final question come in and I hope it means more to you than it does to me. But is three NOP effective in reducing emissions? Yeah, yeah so that's yeah, that's one of the food additives um, that can be used. It's it's been trialed trialed here in Ireland and yeah it definitely has uh, reduce the methane emissions. Um, you know, the trials are still ongoing. Um, probably we're not seeing as much of an effect as it has been reported in other countries, especially when we feed it to grazing animals. Um, but, you know, these food additives, we're testing them the whole time and hopefully, you know, they will probably have some role to play um, in the future in helping to reduce it. Yeah. Are they relatively expensive at the moment? They are, they are. That's that. That's the issue with them. And then, you know, how long do they last after feeding as well? Is something that's that's being investigated at the minute. You know, do you have to feed every day? Probably okay. Maybe in a dairy scenario, but how how would you do that in a sheep and and beef if if you're out, um, if you're not feeding every day? So yeah, there's still there's still the jury's still out on them. Brilliant, brilliant. Anything to add, Kim? No, not really. I mean, the three NOP is one that that has been shown to work. Um. But, that, but yeah, I think Noreen said it all, really. Brilliant. OK, well, we're approaching 8 o'clock, um, so I'll bring the webinar to a close. I don't think there's any further questions, um, but thank you, everybody, for sending your questions in. Thank you also to our um, panellists for this evening for, ask, uh, for answering everybody's questions and hopefully uh, lifting the fog a little bit in relation to, to carbon. Also, a big thank you to, to Bryony, who has been working behind the scenes um, to make sure we didn't have any technical glitches this evening. So when the webinar ends, um, you'll be taken to a, a feedback form. I would really appreciate it if you could um, complete that. It really helps us when we're uh, putting together uh, webinars like this, just to ensure that they're meeting your business needs. So thank you again to everybody who's been listening. Thank you to our panellists uh, once again and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye.